the uh, Tuesday, October 4th, 2016 meeting of the Iowa County Board of Commissioners. Uh, at this time, if you would please bow your heads for a moment of silent prayer or reflection. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get into our formal uh, program, I would like to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Carl Raker, and, uh, who is a senior at Lake Norman High School, who is doing his senior project, uh, observing uh, government in action. So uh, Carl, could you please approach the podium and uh, explain uh, what it is that you're working on and what your goals are? As Chairman Mal Mallory said, uh, my name is Carl Raker. I'm completing my senior project or doing research on my senior project here this evening. And my senior project is about a topic that I feel is underrepresented in American society today, that citizen citizen citizens should be involved in their local government. And I'm kind of going to do this project to inform people about why they should and how they should. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Carl. Uh, we look forward to working with you and uh, uh, look forward to uh, reading the uh, finished product and so that we can uh, improve in our performance. So at this time, uh, we have a presentation of a special recognition and award. And uh, uh, the unit commander of the Mecklenburg County Young Marines uh, uh, Jonathan Henderson has requested a uh, uh, proclamation to be entered, uh, Red Ribbon Week, and uh, Commissioner Ken Robertson uh, will uh, introduce that uh, resolution for the commission and for the public to be aware of. All right. Thank you, uh, Chairman Mallory. The, this uh, proc is a proclamation by the Iredell County Board of Commissioners for Red Ribbon Week, October 23rd through 30th, 2016. And it reads, whereas communities across America have been plagued by the numerous problems associated with illicit drug use and those that traffic in them, and whereas there is hope in winning the war on drugs, and that hope lies in the education and drug demand reduction coupled with the hard work and determination of organizations such as the Mecklenburg County Young Marines of the Marine Corps League to foster a healthy, drug-free lifestyle. And whereas Mr. Thomas Sapp of Mooresville is a member of the Mecklenburg, Young, uh, Mecklenburg County Young Marines, and whereas governments and community leaders know that citizen support is one of the most effective tools in the effort to reduce the use of illicit drugs in our communities, and whereas the red ribbon has been chosen as a symbol commemorating the work of Enrique Kiki Camarina, a drug enforcement administration special agent who was murdered in the line of duty and represents the belief that one person can make a difference. And whereas the red ribbon campaign was established by Congress in 1988 to encourage a drug-free lifestyle and involvement in drug prevention and reduction efforts, and whereas October 23rd through 31st has been designated National Red Ribbon Week, which encourages Americans to wear a red ribbon to show their support for a drug-free environment. Now, therefore, 
be it proclaimed, we, the Iredell County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim October 23rd through 31st as Red Ribbon Week in Iredell County and urge all citizens to join in this special observance, uh, observance adopted this fourth day of October 2016. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make this presentation, if I could, to, uh, to three of the young Marines who are in our audience. Um, the three young Marines are young Marine Chantharat, who uh, attends Kannapolis Intermediate School. He's a fifth grader. Um, young Marine Barber, who's a ninth grader and who's homeschooled, and young Marine uh, Sapp, who is the, is the young man mentioned in our proclamation, and he's a fifth grader at East Mooresville Interme Intermediate. So if I could... Please, please proceed. Young Marines, if you'll join me in the front, please. Again, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right, at this time, uh, Mr. Smith, if you could summarize the uh, adjustments uh, to the agenda. Actually, Mr. Chairman, there are no adjustments tonight. So there is no motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to mention under unfinished business, mm -hmm. I intend to uh, report out on the Elmwood visit. Okay. Give our staff some direction if we could. All right. Under item nine, duly noted as a uh, continuation of our discussion from the pre agenda meeting, uh, under item nine, uh, <coughs> follow up to the uh, meeting two weeks ago concerning the uh, requests by uh, Elmwood. <coughs> Is there any other amendments? For adjustments to the uh, agenda. Uh, with that adjustment, uh, all in favor of adopting the agenda as adjusted, please say aye. 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 Moving on. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Uh, we don't have any appointments before the board uh, that I'm aware of. And we'll move into item seven public hearings. <coughs> with uh, item 7.1, a request from planning to conduct a public hearing to consider case number 1609-1 from Neil Shepard of Blue Ridge Engineering PLLC to rezone approximately 29 acres at 439 Old Moxville Road from 
R20 to GB. And Mr. Matthew Todd, if you'll please uh, kick this off. Okay. Good evening to the board. The uh, request we have uh, before us tonight is uh, outlined in blue. It's a total of 29.1 acres. This parcel here, this one here, and the one directly across the road. Uh, it is adjacent to uh, Statesville's uh, planning area, which is on light industrial. Property is currently zoned R20, which is single family residential. The staff does support this request based on the 2030 horizon plan calling for this area to be employment center industrial flex. The lot is adjacent to commercially zoned property and traffic impacts will not exceed the capacity. Planning board did vote 7-0 to recommend approval of this request. Uh, this is the uh, land use plan of the area. Again, showing the employment center industrial in the green. Uh, this parcel here is just outside of that, but uh, with it being adjacent, staff still recommending for it as well. Here's an aerial image of the property. Uh, these properties here are actually owned by uh, Chris Cartner, who operates the business directly across the road. You can see there are some residences in the area. Uh, I'll point out the side road, White Fox Trail, that is a state maintained road. Uh, here's some pictures of the property. This is showing the larger field toward, uh, looking toward the Statesville planning area over at this tree line. Uh, this is looking uh, at the, one of the existing buildings on the property with the field to the right that we just looked at. Uh, this is the property back across the road directly adjacent to the current operation. There's an existing house on, on the property. Uh, this is a view from White Fox Trail showing the uh, fenced in property. Again, even this cornfield though is part of the request on the back side. Uh, just another image of the properties, part of the petition. Uh, here's that existing house uh, with the, the track on that side. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on this request. Are there questions of uh, Mr. Todd? Are there any issues relative to uh, Current screening. Or the uh, the screening requirements for for GB do require that the screening be 90% opaque. Uh, the current fence that's been put up around this parcel here does not appear to meet those standards at this time. So as they as they get ready to use it, if they get approved on the rezoning, of course they have to submit another site plan that shows how they're going to develop it, where they're going to park the equipment. Um, or any buildings that they're going to do. And at that time, we would evaluate the screening to make sure that it meets the code requirements. But at this time, it doesn't look like it actually meets the code requirements. And what's the setback requirements on this? <clears throat> From any of the residential property, there'll be a 30-foot setback that can't be used for parking, can't be used for buildings. Uh, can't be used for uh, driveway access to the property. It's, it's got to be clear of uh, uses. And there would be a landscaping buffer in that 30 foot setback. So that setback applies whether the fence, no matter where the fence is located. Correct. Adjacent, again, adjacent to the residential properties. So th there wouldn't be a requirement down here. Uh, just up here near these different residential properties and this one up here. Other questions? So a 90% opaque fence and shrubbery are required? For the, uh, the GB zoning with outdoor storage, there's a, I believe there's two options. Uh, one is just a 90% screening 
could be legally in Cyprus with that 30 foot setback, within that 30 foot setback. If they don't want to do the legal in Cyprus, they can do a ten, they can do a fence that's 90 percent opaque with some shrubs uh, along the fence. Okay. So there's kind of two options there for them to do. Any more questions, comments? Across the street where the GB zoning is, I think that's the existing business now. Yes. Uh, it, it, uh, it's adjacent to the R20. What is, what is the zoning, the um, screening requirement there? Yes. Th this piece here that's part of the request, it's going to be that 90%. Sa same as across the yeah, street. Yes, so either the fence with the shrubs or a row at Leland Cypress or something. And is that a house on that? It looks like a piece of vacant land right now. On this piece here? Yeah, it's vacant. It's vacant. There is a there is a church, I believe, that's on this piece here. Huh. Yeah. I have no further. Okay. Anything further? Thank you, Mr. Todd. At this time, I will open the public hearing for uh, the Neil Shepard of Blue Ridge Engineering PLLC uh, rezoning request. Uh, I have listed, uh, signed up to be heard, uh, Mr. Neil Shepard, uh, as well as Linda Fox. Uh, I'll ask uh, each of you to please approach the podium, state your name and your address for the record. Uh, you have a, a five-minute limitation, of, uh, but questions and answers may necessarily uh, extend beyond that. Mr. Uh, Shepard. Good evening. My name is Neil Shepard. I'm an engineer with Blue Ridge Engineering. Mm -hmm. My address is 924 Main Street, North Wilkesboro. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Todd for his presentation. I think that summarizes it very well. Uh, we did go through the planning board process, and it was a 7 to 0 vote there. And I think we, we heard for, from some neighbors there, one of which was, was Ms. Fox, who's here tonight to. Uh, I hope clarify some questions that she had. Uh, but basically what we have here is a, it's a growing business owned by Mr. and Ms. Cartner, and they've been in business for quite some time. They live nearby, and they're members of the community, and what they're trying to do is, is make sure they're in compliance with the zoning code. Uh, the One of the existing parcels there the odd-shaped parcel, I think, was a kennel for a number of years, still operating in R20, and they purchased that property and talking through with them what what should they do to try to fix the problem. And so we looked at the zoning and said, well, that does need to be rezoned. And then the city has proposed an industrial park there south of their property, and so we tried to figure out what's what's the best thing to do here to kind of get things back in order and so that's why we're here tonight uh, there's no big project plan or anything like that they're just trying to, to do some housekeeping here to, to get the zoning in order so that's that's really the the essence of the request I'll be glad to answer any questions anyone may have any questions from board okay. I don't believe so well thank you very much mr. Shepard thank you appreciate it uh, Linda Fox. I'm Linda Fox, and I'm the owner of the property next to where the kennel was, mm -hmm. that they're uh, right there on the corner of White Fox Trail. Okay. And my concern last time was, of course, the traffic on White Fox Trail, but I've talked to Mr. Uh, Cartner since then and there's not a fence or shrub between the kennel property and my property but since then I've talked to him and I I'm fine with it being like it is I don't think that there needs to be shrub or fencing I know that little blue thing points up there I don't know where it is <laughs> but it's but like you say that little piece that comes out to old Moxville Road there on the corner of White Fox Trail, and it's about half of that line. 
Okay. But since then, like I say, I've talked to Mr. Cartner and I'm fine with it. I don't have a problem with there not being shrub or not being fenced there. It's been open all these years when the kennel was there and we've never had a problem okay. with anything. So I just wanted to let the board know I'm good with that. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Fox. We appreciate your uh, sharing uh, your concerns with Mr. Shepard and Mr. Cartner beforehand and uh, resolving those issues and to your mutual satisfaction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is is there anyone else in the audience that desired to be heard on this matter but did not have an opportunity to sign up? Okay. If you could please uh, come to the podium, sir, and uh, state your name and address. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Pastor Mike Bivens of the church property. Uh, if I had the pointer, I could point. Could I borrow the pointer? All right, thank you. The church property is here. The buildings are here, gymnasium, church, and um, electric, electric substation is right here. Um, our property goes all the way down. <coughs> Again, it's vacant, as someone said here. Uh, we did, I've been pastoring nine years before. There was a Christian school here. We've had Christian schools express an interest in using the church, and the property has, in times past, been used for the um, school, Christian school here. And we've had other people ask interest about it, but at present we don't have any definite plans um, but my interest is this back corner of this property has a huge white, I say huge, but it looks like probably the size of a gas tank that goes in a gas station in the ground. It's right in that corner there. And I don't know if it's, it's got corrosive material. The planning zoning, they, they, they already talked to Mr. the country board about it, and I understand they're moving it and relocating it so it's not near that fence there uh, where our property, if we build in the future. So I don't know what's, I think it's fuel, they, Jake, they said. Um, and I'm hearing tonight at this meeting that there's going to be shrubbery and a better fence down through there so it wouldn't be open, visible trucks and equipment for that property right there. And uh, I'm just wanting affirmation about it. I'm. I'm, I'm not opposed to anything. I just want some uh, clarification. Uh, for my clarification, could you state the church that you pastor? Believer's Faith. Believer's Faith, okay. Uh, Mr. Ty, do you want to respond? To... When, when this property here does develop, um, or they start using the property, they would have to submit a site plan. And one of the things on that site plan is we're going to check to make sure that their screening meets the code requirements. And again, those code requirements uh, for, for GB depends on if there's outside storage or not, which it sounds like there would probably be outside storage. Then it's going to trigger the 90% opaque screening requirement, and there's the two options on how they do that with the fence and shrubs or with... Um, full vegetation along the property. So it will have some screening when it gets used as commercial property. Pastor Bivens, does that clarify, give, a, give you a warm and fuzzy? I'm, I'm just uh, curious about the, the liquid in ground being on that property if it's permanently placed in the ground that tank near that fence um, I'm just curious about that kind of thing is this a mobile tank or is that going to be right there at that edge and if it's just an opaque I guess opaque sounds um, not firm to me I don't, I don't know what you mean by opaque uh, but right now it's a chain link fence it's got some plastic running through it and um, so I'm just curious about any corrosive material that might be put in the ground nearby our property there. Um, I don't know. 
Mr. Shepard, do you have any idea what is in that uh, tank? I did receive a call from Mr. Lowman in the planning department. I was unaware the tank was there, but uh, this is a an above ground fuel storage tank that was purchased recently by Mr. Cartner. It was a state surplus item. I think he bought it in Wilmington or somewhere, but it's essentially a piece of equipment that he's brought here and offloaded uh, in that storage area there. He doesn't intend to install it there. It, it, it doesn't go underground to start with. It's an above ground tank, but uh, he just he brought it there and unloaded it before it goes to its final place, but it's not intended to go where it's sitting. It's just parked there. But it's, it doesn't have anything in it. It doesn't today. have anything no, in it. No, it's empty. Okay. Can I ask Mr. Shepard a question? Mr. Shepard, there was some discussion during the agenda briefing about the 30-foot setback and Apparently what occurs in the 30-foot setback, any fence that is erected is 30 feet off the property line, thereby assuring that there will not be any equipment stored or any vehicles parked near the property line. But uh, it seems the applicant went ahead and erected a fence that is on the property line. Do you, do you know what his intent are or, or have you had discussions with uh, Mr. Cartner about how he's going to if he leaves the fence there, how he is going to give some safeguard that there will be a 30-foot setback from that fence? No, we started having those discussions today, but we haven't gotten that far as far as a site plan or anything. What we're trying to do is get through the rezoning first. And I, I mean, to be honest with you, I think he probably jumped the gun a little bit with the fence, just trying to trying to make things better when maybe it would have been better to to plan a little better. But we'll address those. You know, issues as time goes on, we'll have to submit a site plan to the planning folks and get everything squared away. That'd be more of a permitting issue than a zoning than a rezoning issue. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, anyone else care to be heard? Seeing none, I'll call. The, uh, I'll close this public hearing. Uh, ask for any further comments uh, from uh, commissioners. Hearing none, is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I would move to approve the zoning map amendment and to make a finding that the approval is consistent with the adoption of the 2030 Horizon Plan. And that said, approval is reasonable and in the public's interest and furthers the goals of the 2030 Horizon Plan because it's adjacent to commercially uh, zoned property and industrially zoned property, and uh, the traffic impact should not exceed the road capacity. Motion by Commissioner Bowles. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Shepard, Pastor Bivens, and Ms. Fox. Now move on to agenda item 7.2, which is a request to rezone approximately 15 acres at uh, 2079 and 2089 Charlotte Highway from residential agricultural to light manufacturing. Um, and uh, Mr. Todd, if you could summarize, please. Uh, yes, this request, again, is outlined in blue on the screen. It's just south of the 21-115 uh, split as you go into Mooresville. Uh, staff does support this request based on the fact that the 2030 Horizon Plan calls for a majority of the area to be employment center industrial flex, and the lot is adjacent to commercially zoned property. Uh, planning board did vote four to three to recommend approval of this request. Uh, this is the map showing the uh, 2030 Horizon Plan with, again, the green showing the, the employment center, which a majority of the parcel falls in it. Uh, the one parcel here uh, is falling outside of it into the uh, medium density residential area, while the other parcel is falling into uh, the uh, high density uh, mixed use zoning designation. 
Uh, here's an aerial of the property. You can see the, uh, the neighboring commercial businesses as well as the uh, scattered residential sites around the property. Uh, this is a uh, Glory Road, and I'll point out on the site, you've got Glory Road running off Charlotte Highway adjacent to the site. Again, Glory Road is also a state-maintained road. Uh, that's the intersection there, so the property is, is this back in here. Just another image of the property. The picture was just taken here, looking into the property. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on this request. Questions from Mr. Todd? What is the present use of that uh, GB conditional use district that would be toward Statesville Highway from there? Is that an old, uh, an old gas station? Yeah. This one here? Is it an old gas station site? I do not know right off the top of my head. Yeah, actually, I believe it's vacant. I believe that's B. Ross vacant gas station site. Okay. The planning board voted four to three. Who are the three that voted against? Do you recall? It's in here. I have to look it up. Two for kneeling and aiming. It was on page 10. And the uh, applicants do not have a, a uh, specific use in mind, is that correct? That's correct. Opposed were uh, Christy Pfeiffer, Jeff McNeely, and David Amann. Any further questions for Mr. Todd? Well, at this time, I'll declare this public hearing to be open. Uh, I have uh, Mr. Paul Calloway that is uh, signed up to be heard. Five minutes, uh, not including questions and answers. If you'll please out your name and address. Good. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for the time. My name is Paul Calloway. I'm a local resident of uh, Iredell County. Been a businessman in that area for 41 years. Uh, we've, our company is running an industrial cleaning business and have been, like I say, for 41 years. Our family business has cash properties. We have properties on Brawley School Road undeveloped. We've developed a piece of property in Lakeside Park, a uh, 15,000 square foot commercial building, which we lease out office and, uh, you know, just use, use it commercially, where it be, whether it be a uh, uh, maybe a detail shop or something of that nature. We built in uh, Talbert Point Business Park in 1999, and in that unit we got 22,500 square feet of building, which we lease out to uh, screen printer, embroider company, a sign company, a company that uh, does props for races, and then we take 8,000 square feet of the building for ourselves. We weren't uh, intending to buy this property. It became on the market uh, just through a family relation, and so we, we did purchase the property. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, we do not have specific plans for the property. We do know that as that area grows, to the north. There's going to be a lot of need for uh, something that would benefit the community. And uh, my thoughts are down the road that it may change once we get it rezoned is maybe think about uh, maybe a grocery store or something of that nature that would benefit the area. And possibly on the back area there, we could build some commercial buildings like we've done in the past if the zoning would permit it. type of watershed is this in? It's, it's out of the watershed, sir. It's out of it. 
Yes. That's, that was my understanding. Questions for Mr. Callaway? Thank you very much, Mr. Yes, Callaway. thank you. I'll uh, inquire uh, of the audience uh, if there's anyone else that would like to be heard that didn't have an opportunity to sign up. Seeing none, I will close this public hearing. Uh, is there any further discussion? Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'll offer a motion to approve the zoning map amendment to make a finding that the approval is consistent with the adopted 2030 horizon plan and that said approval is reasonable and in the public interest and furthers the goals of the 2030 horizon plan because it is in harmony with the area and is adjacent to commercially zoned property. Motion by Commissioner Johnson. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to agenda item 7.3, a request to rezone approximately two acres at 1262 Oak Ridge Farm Highway from highway residential agricultural to neighborhood business and highway business. And Mr. Todd? You could please summarize. Uh, yes, the uh, parcel uh, for this request is outlined in blue. The parcel itself does cross Alexander Acres, uh, so there's two pieces, even though it does have one pin number. Uh, staff does support this request based on the parcel being adjacent to a rural commercial node and, and is partially zoned neighborhood business. Uh, the lot is adjacent to commercially zoned property. The planning board. Uh, approved this recommended approval 7-0. Uh, this is just a zoomed in image showing the uh, request. This piece again is being requested for NB while this piece here is being requested for HB. Currently there's a uh, mini storage facility on this piece and the owner is wanting to purchase this piece if it gets rezoned in order to uh, offer him some more flexibility based on the watershed standards and some setback standards. As I understand, there's no immediate plans for the development of this piece. Uh, here's the land use plan, again showing the rural commercial node uh, coming adjacent to the property. Here's the area of the property. There is an existing, uh, I'll say, residential structure on the front up near the NB. And then you see the mini, the mini storage across Alexander Acres. Uh, this is uh, looking at the main property on the right. Uh, the existing NB is this piece over here. And it goes down here and it crosses the road to the other triangle piece. Uh, this is looking back up toward 150, the intersection. Properties on our left. Uh, looking down toward the triangle piece, it's part of the request. It's down in the woods here. Just another shot of it. And I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions from the board. Mr. Todd, is that typical that a piece that stretches across a, I guess, a state road would have the same tax pin? Uh, yeah, you see it sometimes. Um, I, don't, I don't know the specifics of how the tax department decides when they split something. Uh, I'm assuming it has to do with when a right-of-way is created, but you do see that. Any additional questions for Mr. Todd? Thank you, Mr. Todd. I'm going to open uh, this public hearing. Uh, we have three folks that have signed up uh, to be heard. I believe there's a, uh, I think it's a Jason Pierce. Jerome, Jerome Pierce. Okay. If you could come up and please uh, announce your name for the record and your address.
My name is Jerome Pearson. I apologize. A real estate broker with laryngitis is a hard problem, but we have to move on. <clears throat> I am a broker. I am an owner of Jerome Pearson, Inc. I'm here tonight to speak for the owners. I am trying to help the owner get the property under one ownership with one zoning and sell off the back tip to the neighbor. Basically, I grew up in Wilkes County, Moravian Falls, went to Appalachian, graduated with a BS, went to Appalachian another year and graduated with a master's degree. I'm one of the few people still alive that are old enough to have graduated from Appalachian State Teachers College and Appalachian State University. I'm proud of that, if nothing else. I taught school in Greensboro for 13, or 12 and 13 years, uh, depending on how you counted it. I decided that at some point it was time for me to get out and get a real job, and I did. I went into real estate selling residential. For 25 years, I was in commercial. I do residential to start with, but I found out commercial was more to my liking. I like entitlement. That's what this is called, of talking about unifying a piece of property, making it ready to be sold. In the residential market, you call that setting it up for cleaning it up or making it easier to sell. A lot of people are afraid of this step in dealing with any property. A lot of them don't like to have the meetings on site. I do. I'm here tonight with the owner, Lars Egbert and Rob Downing, the gentleman who owns the mini warehouse. I had 50,000 square feet mini warehouse complex in Greensboro. I have another one that I'm starting through the zoning process in Mooresville. That's just to say that I understand the problems. To have your comment of the one piece of property that's split by road is not advantageous. This way the man has a unified piece that he can use for his property. Water quality is a very necessary issue that all counties are facing. <clears throat> My client bought the property in 2007. He's held it, he's paid for it, and he lived through the crush. For that, he ought to be uh, applauded. A lot of us didn't. He wants to sell it, but the whole thing comes down to he needs it one zoning. So that whatever we sell it for or we get, go to, then we still have to come back, do the site plan work, and show you who has it, what they want. But I'll probably be doing that also, I hope. The bottom line is, gentlemen, I'm here tonight to ask you to please approve the zoning so that this man can straighten out his partnerships and his other dealings that need to be corrected. As everybody knows in real estate, it all gets very complicated and every step you take makes it an easier process to get through it. If there are any questions, I'll speak to them, or either the owner or the buyer of this, a little piece will be glad to answer your questions. So call for the question and say thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Any <coughs> questions? Okay. Uh, Got two additional folks who have uh, signed up, and uh, I couldn't begin to read the signature, so I'll call whoever lives at 112 Lauren Glen Drive. And if you'll break our suspense and let us know your name. <laughs> uh, good evening. Thanks for uh, taking the time tonight, Commissioners. Uh, my name's Rob Downing. Um, Doctor. Uh, no, sir. <laughs> um, as your own uh, said earlier, uh, my wife and I, we own the mini storage there, uh, the highway business owned uh, section, and uh, looking to purchase this, just a small, uh, just a small triangular piece here, uh, if we're able to get it rezoned highway business uh, for some possible expansion in the future. 
that's the basics of it. So any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Downey. Thank you. Okay. Well, the person at 135 Sundown Road. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Lars Eckberg. I'm the owner of the property. I think Jerome and Rob did a pretty good job explaining what we're doing over here. Um, I'll answer any questions I can. Any questions of Mr. Eckbert? I don't believe so. Great. We're good to go. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else uh, in the audience uh, to be heard? Yes, please. If you'll come up uh, and uh, state your name for the record and your address. Good evening. Hi. My name is Charlotte Green, and I live at 1758 Landis. I'm the property that's adjacent. Okay, Ms. Green. So, uh, gentlemen, th I do have a lot of concerns with making this change. Uh, the first thing that I have is the fact that it's been stated to be within the 2030 horizon plan. And in fact, on the Iredell County horizon plan, this is all expected to be residential. And if you look at the Mooresville 2030 plan, it is also expected to be rural residential agriculture. So as you look at these two, first the plans, they don't seem to match what the intention is here. Um, the second thing that I have a concern with is even if uh, it were consistent. If you look at the majority of the properties around here, they are actually residential. My mother-in-law, I am the, I'm the, right where the Morrisville Municipal Area is, that's actually my property, that whole odd-shaped area. The two properties that are up on the upper left corner are actually my mother-in-law. One of the things that she's looking to do as she's retired and is trying to downsize, we were actually looking to put her in a home next to the other side of the road off of Alexander Acres, that little corner down there is also my property. So as we look at that area all down Alexander Acres and everything down into Mooresville is actually all residential. The closest thing is three quarters of an acre or three quarters of a mile down the street. The only things that are in here are other than the mini storage are a few neighborhood businesses. So the neighborhood businesses are your mom and pop type areas, and they're your salons. Um, so you have a beauty parlor, you might have a lawyer's office or something like that. They're all very much neighborhood businesses. If you were to rezone this whole area, that's about five acres. That that's no longer a neighborhood business. That's no longer something that can be more uh, to the liking of the community. That now can become something much larger and really disruptive. So I do have a concern with that. The other thing uh, one of the gentlemen brought up was the zoning piece. The, I understand it may be inconvenient to have it zoned multiple ways, but that NB was actually just as 150 was cut through here. They did about the 150 feet back all along there for neighborhood businesses. It was never meant to be completely rezoned as an HB or NB. The mini storage did at one point get changed to that HB much to the dislike of most of the members of the community because the whole rest of it is truly residential and neighborhood businesses. Uh, he also talked about the watershed in the HB area and as I do have a concern with that as well because in fact as of today I'm not even sure that he is within compliance and I'm actually trying to get a site plan and confirm all of that. Um, in fact there's large piping that actually discharges onto my property with a whole bunch of water coming. So if he were to continue to expand that, I have great concerns. Can you kind of point out where the, the pipe is and, and where it uh, comes into your property, the discharges? Thank you. So it comes right here into the corner, right off of the corner of, of he has a fenced area there. And that's basically runoff from the, the uh, from the entire parking area. And it, 
and the statements here of it's completely adjacent to everything commercial, it really isn't. This, this area, if you look at the zoning maps for the 2030 plans, this is an agricultural and residential area. Are there any other questions for Ms. Green? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. If you could stand by, though. Uh, Mr. Todd, could you address some of the issues that Ms. Green raised relative to consistency with the 2030 Horizon Plan and also, I think, uh, clarifying what I mean, you know, the additional acreage, whether that impacts the size of a business or what's allowed to go in there based on the neighborhood business designation. I'm just talking about that larger track, not the small triangular track contiguous to the HB. Sure. I'll, I'll first touch on the land use plan. The, the land use plan for a large part is a conceptual plan. I mean, you can see, you know, you've got a node here at the intersection. Obviously, obviously those nodes are very conceptual. It doesn't mean a zoning line would have to follow that, even though just outside of it, the plan says agricultural residential. That's again because these nodes are conceptual in nature, as well as the strip that's coming out, out to the side here. So that's where you know, from a staff perspective, you know, we're 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 under the argument that it is in compliance with that land use plan. It's not falling within these boundaries, and that's pretty typical of any of our rezonings. You know, a lot of, a lot of times they don't fall exactly within the boundaries, again, because of the conceptual nature. But also with the front half already being zoned neighborhood business, all those factors kind of come into us making a recommendation uh, to support or to, to, den to recommend denial of a request. As far as the uh, development potential of this uh, property again it is neighborhood business request uh, previously it has been requested for for highway business once before and maybe even before that as well highway business does allow for outside storage where neighborhood business does not allow for outside storage I think that's a that's a, that's a significant difference between the two uh, before I believe there was a used car lot plan for this property used car lots or car lots in general are not allowed in neighborhood business. So neighborhood business is a, is a pretty restrictive commercial zoning designation. Any other questions for Mr. Todd? Uh, I do have a question for It was Mr. Uh, Downing that has the uh, storage facility. Uh, are you aware of this uh, of the water runoff issue? I purchased the property as <clears throat> excuse me as as it sits now. Um, there is some drainage down in that area. I'm not exactly sure where. I believe it actually comes out on onto this section right here, but I'm not 100% sure where those fence lines are and where that pipe actually comes out or where those those property lines are. Okay, Mr. Todd, are there any issues with water discharge? Uh, no, the, the zone. Yeah, the zoning on, on a request like this would not regulate the the placement of that discharge. <clears throat> Mr. Todd, if uh, Mr. Downing submits a site-specific plan for development for this little triangular piece here, uh, would that um, would inside of that HB conditional use district, uh, this would be a neighborhood business piece, correct? The, the triangular piece that's going to be neighborhood business. It, it's going to be HB. HB. It's going to be consistent. It's going to be with the HB. With and, that. In order to have the mini storage, it would have to be HB. But at that point, once he submits a plan under HB, then that should address the runoff problems, correct? Potentially address the runoff. And then, honestly, with the topography, 
uh, you know, most likely, and, and he could speak to this more than I could, this is probably going to be as a piece to leverage impervious area somewhere else on the property. Um, again, he could probably speak more to that, but um, most likely that is the case. Okay. Mr. Downey, do you know what your impervious calculation is right now? I believe right now I'm in the low 60s um, with a 70% allowable. Um, this is approximately four tenths of an acre. And uh, with what Mr. Todd was just saying, yes, I have no intention to develop that triangular piece. Um, I've, I've got uh, closer to the road, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got, uh, you know, area that's, that's very buildable. Um, and I would use that area to, to expand if, if, if I ever do. Okay. But Mr. Todd, when he su submits a site specific plan, then that would involve that little triangular piece as far as water runoff. That, that would mitigate that issue at that time. From erosion control, yes. Okay. The, the two pieces, they're about two acres total, yes? Yes. Okay. And, and the little triangle next to the storage facility is 0.4 acres. Y'all just said it was about 0.4 acres. I believe that's correct. So that means that the, that the area right under that neighborhood business, that shape is 1.6 acres. And it'll be zone HB with the, with the, sh no, the, the, no, the NB, the NB, NB, I'm NB. sorry, NB. Okay. So <clears throat> with that, that 1.6 acres just kind of standing alone it really uh, probably couldn't be used for very much, could it? With the shape that it's in, at 1.6 acres. You know, may maybe for one residential house, that would be about. For a neighborhood business, though. But for a neighborhood business. Yeah. Yeah, it would. It would need to be combined. Are there any additional questions or comments? Um, let me just look for a second. This little, okay, you use it. The little triangle, he's buying it for water quality issues. He's got to come back in with anything he does and submit a site plan. That is their opportunity to come in and say, we want this. The other piece <clears throat> under, the, un, under the NB, we're trying to get this neighborhood business the same as this already is so that we can put whatever. We can only develop 60% of this. That is basically what's happening. 40% trying to do is kind of square it up, something like this, and we'll still have to keep the rest of it for either water quality or uh, septic fields. <laughs> We don't have any water and sewer out there at this time. The cost is 1,500 feet at $60 a linear foot until it goes up, which makes it much more advantageous to be a productive piece of property within the tax base to be like it zoned as one piece, one zoning, one piece. Uh, the lady spoke to the fact that everything's residential, this is her property. If it's zoned commercial, it's going to be worth a lot more. And to be honest with you, for those of you that ever been in real estate or training classes, the first one I ever had, they said, it's a wagon wheel. Here's your hub. Out here's your belt line around it, and the spokes of the roads out. 
That's what this is. This is a hub in the next 10 years. But that's up to you as a group of commissioners. Is that what you want? That's just a, this is just planning for the future. It's there. It's within your node. We're just trying to take this one piece and put it together. Thank you for your time, and I apologize for my voice. Anyone else uh, care to be heard? Okay, we will close this public hearing. And uh, any further comments? Question? Um, can I ask Mr. Todd a question? So, if if, if he's if the storage units get the triangle in the back, then that they wouldn't put more units back there. What that does is it frees them up to put additional units closer to the highway. Uh, that's, that's correct. Technically, I mean, they could try to put some, but again, based on the topography, they I don't think. It, yeah, they're not, if yeah. that's where the water's flowing, they're not putting any yeah. units. They cut, um, in our zone, our zoning would let them put units closer to the highway, but Mooresville's zoning would not. When, when, when we talked about this the very first time, Boy, I wouldn't want to bet on my memory, but I, I know that the town of Mooresville was a bit concerned over how close businesses got to the highway, to, to the road. They consider that an entrance in, into Mooresville. So, so is that a true statement that if they were in the town zoning jurisdiction, they would not be allowed put units closer but under our zoning they can I, I cannot answer that you know my my understanding my re, my memory from the first time is it had to do with that that was the gateway for one of the gateways for Mooresville and honestly they did not want a used car lot on the property and that was back in 2012 but that that's what I remember from that fat past request I thought I thought the car lot was was if you at, at the Y intersection, if you veered left, and it was on the right hand side. It, so it was no. proposed for this piece. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I, I, voted, voted, I voted in favor of the rezoning, and it didn't pass. I just didn't think Mooresville ought to dictate to folks out in the county what they could do on their property. But to the point that uh, Ms. Green made about the water runoff, if the uh, northern part of the property or the upper part of the property is further developed based on the addition of the quarter acre HB to the, the entire total, that's going to create more impervious surface and create more water runoff. So at that point in time there'll have to be a site plan approved and it's at that point in time that that issue would need to be addressed. Is that, am I correct? If it, it, if, if it is an issue that's demonstrated. Right. It's just that zoning, we, as long as the water's flowing the direction it's supposed to flow then that, that's the limit of our zoning ordinance. Um. Today, yeah. But when you get into approving specific site improvements and additions, then those impacts are taken into account, are they not? Uh, not, not, from a, not from a stormwater. The county does not have a stormwater ordinance in place. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask Mr. Downing then. You know, that's a concern that Ms. Green has. Obviously, if, if you have the ability to create more impervious surface, it's going to potentially create more water runoff on her property. Um, how do you intend to address that? I mean, give her some assurances that you're not going to exacerbate what is already a problem. Yeah, certainly uh, we would evaluate where that pipe is even draining at. Like I said, I'm, I'm not 100% familiar with where those lines are back there. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we can f 
figure out where that is and uh, correct any issues if, or correct any issues that would, would come up from that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Todd, is, is this in the watershed? It is in the Critical watershed. Critical four watershed. It's actually uh, the split split with the watersheds. Um, I believe the maximum they could develop is up to 70%. Yeah, if he's at, he's, if he's at 60 now and he exceeds 70, he couldn't exceed 70%. Yeah, he cannot exceed the 70. Does he have a retention pond at this point? No, and that, that's, not, that's not part of this watershed that he's in. Um, okay. You know the high density option with the with the detention ponds or, or retention ponds. Um, that's not an option for this particular watershed. But wouldn't he have to have Deaner's approval on his sp specific plan if he wanted to I I expand any more? Wouldn't he have to have Deaner's approval? Uh, no, no. Again, we we would probably view it from an erosion control standpoint, but not from a stormwater aspect. Okay. The only stormwater aspect we're going to look at is the impervious coverage. Do you Doesn't know? that directly impact erosion? It, it does, and they all tie tie in. But it, yeah. but the the watershed ordinance is only addressing impervious area. It doesn't go beyond that unless you're doing a high density request, which isn't an option for this area for this particular watershed area. Do you know if there's any erosion at this present time? I do not know that. Ms. Green, can you comment on exactly what this, what, is it water that's pooling? Is it water that's cutting, a, a, you know, the, the mini Grand Canyon or what's going on? Yes, please. Yeah. A little background on myself. I'm a commercial general contractor. We build storage units very similar to Mr. Downing's along with other buildings. The current drainage on his property doesn't even drain onto my property, much less Ms. Green's property. Their property, uh, when it was under construction, was built to code. It was inspected. There are no drainage issues other than natural rainwater, which we all have on all our properties. Mr. Downing's property is in compliance with all the codes, all the soil and erosion at this point. Can, can I answer any questions to that effect? Okay. Okay. We're fine. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Thank you. Any further comments, or is there a motion? Or? How, Mr. Todd, how far is it from this property to the Mooresville town limits? Is this Mooresville municipal planning area, is that in their ETJ? It, it is their ETJ. So, I mean, the point I'm driving at here, that that's the Mooresville municipal planning area so they do have some well they have almost total say so as far as what zoning or what type of development can occur in that area even though those people live in the county correct so in effect if we go by the recommendation on this property we're de facto extending their ETJ in essence so we're, I mean, I'm not trying to exaggerate, but where does this end? Union Grove? I mean, at some point, they've got control over this much area, and it stops here. If we're going to just 
you know, acquiesce to morsel desires for what they want, it's, why do we even have a board of commissioners is my argument. I'm not trying to totally disconnect the two. You want to work with the municipalities, but they do, by statute, have zoning authority. But there's got to be a limit outside their their city limits as to how far that authority goes. The limit is is how far this board allows it to go. That's true. Well, why yeah, would my our rezoning of this clarity of what was allowed and what was Pardon? not? Why does our rezoning of this extend because automatically their planning area? Because if we if we say we're not going to do this because <clears throat> Morsel doesn't want it, then by de facto we've extended their ETJ. Nobody's made the right. argument that right. we should do something. I didn't say anybody it. said. I'm making the argument that it does. Well, I, I think that, regardless of what anybody else says. Well, Mr. Chairman, that's I'm, an opinion. I'm, it is. I'm, I'm free to, to make, express it, and I just did. <laughs> I'm prepared to make a motion if okay. you folks that entertain it uh, to address Miss Green's concerns. <clears throat> There are areas all over this county that have these little quirks where the zoning doesn't quite fit, where uh, the lines that are set forth by the 2030 horizon, horizon Plan. And I was unaware that there are actually parcels of property that would be separated by a state road that are on the same tax pen. But, but nevertheless, the, the, in our zoning uh, ordinances are very complicated, but we have to, at a case-by-case -case basis, try to clean these things up as we go. And while we can't make it palatable for everybody in those areas, we have to at least try to make an attempt to make it better. And um, I'll be honest with you, I believe at this particular point we need to try to make this better. Because having the NB uh, up there and the piece of property split by two different zoning designations and the little piece across the street, we need to try to do something to make this better. Now that particular area, obviously with Kerrigan Farms and the mini storage and all the other little businesses down toward the stoplight as you travel east, um, I, have to, I have to believe that this is, is consistent with the intent of the 2030 Horizon Plan. And as far as your water uh, runoff problem, obviously water's gonna run downhill. Now the question is, is is it running faster or doing damage because of the develop development that has taken place? Well, the fact of the matter is that development has already taken place. Now we have to try to address any future problems, and sometimes you can go back and clean up things when you make a zoning change or you submit a site-specific plan of development. Sometimes you can clean up messes from before. But uh, at this particular point, with that said, uh, uh, Chairman, I would uh, make a motion to approve the zoning map amendment and to uh, make the findings that the approval is reasonably consistent with the adoption of the 2030 Horizon Plan. And that said approval is reasonable in, in the public's interest and furthers the goals of the 2030 Horizon Plan because the tax parcel adjacent is a rural commercial node, a uh, partially zoned NB and uh, adjacent to the other commercially zoned properties. So I would submit that as a motion, sure. sir. Motion by Commissioner Bowles. Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, let me say I was a little bit vigorous in my argument, and I apologize, but I have a long history of uh, not being a great fan of ETJ. I, I do, do happen to believe that if a, a governing body is going to dictate to you what you can do on your property, I think you should have the right to vote for it. ETJ, I think, obliterates that right, and consequently, I'm not a fan of it. And, uh, I was just going to add, I guess, to, to Mr. Bull's discussion. I'm, boy, th this is one of those votes where I'm going to, on my way home, I, I don't know if I'm going to get this one right. Uh, and, and, and I'll give you the intellectual argument, and I'll give you the emotional argument. The intellectual argument is these intersections are going to go business. Are everywhere in the county, everywhere in the county where we have highways that intersect, we know that they're going to, there's, they're going to be businesses there. And, uh, 
and 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 as the real estate agent said, once once they go that way, the property values will go up, and and I guess you could say, you know, for people who are selling it, they they could sell it for more money than if it was just a residential area. But I look at your piece of land, and I know you got a little piece of heaven on earth. And and boy, when I I think of myself, what you know. Would I want to be sitting in your shoes? Man, the emotional part of me says, yeah, we're going to make, we can make the right decision and she will pay the price. Um, because if they, if, uh, if they combine those two pieces of property that will be neighborhood business, you're going to have a business. You will be the one. You will be on that line between residential and business. And if you're on the residential side of that line, you're, you're always the loser. I'd like to add a comment to Mr. Now, Robert. I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, to me, that's just the, ult that's the ultimate struggle. Do I think 10 years from now they may end up with a whole lot more money selling it if, if we'll rezone theirs neighborhood business? Probably so, but um, certainly will be a lot of heartache. But... I mean, everywhere else in the county, when people have come and we've had two highways that intersect, and somebody said, I've lived there for 35 years, and there was always a cornfield across the street, and now you all want to build a dentist office or an insurance office, and, you know, I, I, I have to vote consistent, but I'm just, I'm really struggling with this one. Ms. Green Ms. sits. Miss Green sits in a double jeopardy situation because across the street from her lies a piece of property that is surrounded by mm -hmm. three roads and that is really the highest and best use of that property is not going to be residential. I mean, right. let's face it, that's a, that's a QT site. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and I know. I Do what now? Church on. Okay, a, por a portion of it is, is not there. The, the, the one closest to the school. Oh, the one closest to the school. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, so, so, you know, and at that point, it, that is, that's a piece of property that's not easily developed, and, 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 and DOT is going to have their way with whoever does that, with right ins, right outs, and go down a half a mile and turn around and come back, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but uh, but it's, gonna, it, it's not an easily developed piece of property, but to be quite frank with you, they're really the only use. Who would want to live out in the middle of that? I mean, I know there is a residence there, and he has, the, 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 that family has lived there for 20, 30 years. I understand that, but that's, that's going to fall victim to commercial development sooner or later. time the property was brought it was turned down correct yeah because that, that the, the county board felt like it was too harsh a change we got to meet in the middle somewhere here it's a plan that that they can do whatever's allowed in nb and that's a lot better than whatever's allowed in gb yeah or hb yeah, i want to I want to congratulate Mr. Robertson. Those are usually the type of mental processes I go through on the way home after a zoning case. I've always said that if you're ever completely comfortable how you vote on one of these things, that's a clear indication you've been here too long. Mr. Robertson, I congratulate you after a long tenure on this board. Demonstrate perhaps you haven't been here too long because you still earnestly seek the right thing to do, and I congratulate you on that. Uh, as a practical matter, commercial property along thoroughfares such as this generally tend to, to go business. And uh, you got to put business property somewhere because if you don't have business property somewhere, who's going to, what property is going to pay for all the services 
as a consequence of residential development. And if you're going to put it somewhere, that'll be along a long commercial corridor because who, who wants to build a house on that road and have a, a, high, a driveway cut out on the road? I, I don't want to back out into that road. So I, I think it's just a logical pro progression that, to a great extent the market dictates. And uh, I do think that that will increasingly be a commercial car. It's just, just the way those type of things happen. We saw what happened down Williamson Road beginning 20 years ago, and I was accurate in my forecast as to type of what to develop, and I was grossly in errors in regard to how quickly it would happen. It happened about twice as fast as it would, and it'll happen here too. So uh, I believe it's in the best. Uh, I believe the right decision is to vote in favor of the rezone. Further comments? I'll just say what uh, Ms. Green, the, the large tract of land that you mentioned your grandmother's home was up in uh, one of the two small corners and that you also own that where the where it says municipal, so the Moore's Municipal Planning Area, that's your that's large piece first. of property. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, there's no cookie cutter approach to this. It, it's all very fact dependent and and uh, people dependent. Um, and I, I share the uh, sentiments that uh, have been uh, articulated before about you know the difficulty of reconciling you know the the, the economic development imperative versus the uh, Long-standing traditional home sites and family land. Uh, just looking at the the situation, the way it is developed, it just seems like a a natural cleanup, as has been described by Commissioner Bowles, of of uh, splitting properties that really ought to be clarified and be consistent. Uh, that being said. Uh, if your mom was living slap up against that, that would that would have a different impact on me. The the large amount of acreage that she does own or you do own, that is a buffer from whatever goes on uh, in that directly across from the uh, already zoned HB. That's the uh, self storage area. Uh, isn't uh, likely to uh, to impact her. I, I agree that that if there's development that's attracted across the street, that's obviously going to have a significant impact. But if you feel that that's safe uh, based on its uh, ownership by a church, then uh, I don't think there'll be a QT there. I suppose. But um, uh, given those the weighing of those factors and and the and the this sense of separation that your residences have from what this area of activity and the, the uh, uh, development potential there, I, I'd have to support the motion. Uh, so at this, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, motion by Commissioner Bowles. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously, uh, but not easily. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate you all, all being here and sharing your perspectives. We'll now move on to uh, item eight, administrative matters that uh, were discussed as uh, appropriate on a consent agenda uh, at our pre-agenda meeting. Uh, Mr. Smith, if you could please summarize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, item one is a request from finance for the adoption of a resolution to join the NCACC risk management pool for the workers' compensation program. Item two is a request from finance for the adoption of the North and South Idle School High Schools Capital Projects Project Funds. Item three is a request from ICATS to call for a public hearing on October 18th as required in order to apply for transportation grants. Item four is a request from Fire Services to release $18,372 to Iredell County Rescue Squad for engine replacement of Rescue 8, a medium-duty rescue vehicle. 
Item 5, a request from the Sheriff's Office to approve Budget Amendment Number 5 for the replacement of the Sheriff's Office Records Management System, Jail Management System, and a sole source designation for SunGuard Public Sector, LLC. And Item 6 was a request from the Clerk to the Board for approval of minutes for the meeting, for, excuse me, September 20th, 2016 meeting. Okay. Is there any further discussion of those items? Is there a motion to uh, adopt the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Motion by Vice Chairman Norman. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we have no announcements of any vacancies on boards or commissions this evening. Uh, we do have one appointment to a board and commission to uh, Partners Behavioral Health Board of Directors. Um, Have uh, Gail Mitchell, who has volunteered to serve again, is the, there a motion? I would nominate Miss Mitchell, Mr. Chairman. I served with her on that board a number of years, and she's an excellent member. Okay. Is there a motion to? Uh, can I say that that's a motion uh, to approve by acclamation. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 I suppose like <laughs> motion adopted. Uh, moving on to item 11, unfinished business. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to continue our discussion that we had begun at the pre-agenda meeting relative to the uh, uh, meetings that uh, Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Bowles had with uh, Elmwood Strong and staff to discuss their uh, requests for uh, uh, consideration of a uh, Polluting industry ordinance together with a moratorium uh, pending any of those discussions uh, or adoptions. So uh, I will uh, ask uh, Commissioner Johnson if he could uh, summarize and some of the issues that were developed. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we were charged with speaking with the folks out in Elmwood and we came away with uh, some of the concerns that they had and some they made some specific recommendations as to how we should uh, prove forward let me first speak to the to the issue of a moratorium uh, I think you can make an argument for a moratorium I think you can make a legitimate argument in this case against the moratorium on balance I think the better argument in this case is against a complete moratorium and I think so for the following reasons if we did not have a county ordinance in place and there was no firewall against a, a type of development that some folks may find terribly egregious then probably if you had no zoning then the only safeguard you got for those folks is a moratorium because they can basically do it by right and all they have to secure is a building permit Land development in Iredale County is much more structured than that. We're more heavily populated than a lot of counties. And back in, I guess, the early 90s is when they finally adopted uh, countywide zoning in the county. It's been modified a number of times since I've been on this board. I do believe that we can accomplish what we need to accomplish in a much shorter time frame without a moratorium, given the fact that we do have safeguards in place now. I believe we can do it faster by recommending or making a motion that we amend certain ordinances rather than declare a moratorium, which would take at a minimum two weeks longer because we'll have to schedule a public hearing as to whether we will declare a moratorium or not. I think we can accomplish a lot of what we want to accomplish here this evening without doing that and set this process in motion tonight. Let me report out that the folks is in regard to R53 and R56, which has to do with asphalt and concrete plants, and also mining and quarry. What the folks at Elmwood would like to see is a setback of 1,500 feet from the property line in R53 and 56. They want a buffer that is adjacent to commercial property, which would consist of a fence 10 feet tall 
a vegetated buffer 50 feet wide with rows no more than five feet apart and alter alternate spacing, and it can be natural, three feet at plant, high at planting and 10 feet at maturity, adjacent to residential use, a fence 10 feet high, a berm 15 feet at base, five feet tall, and plants on top of the buffer berm at three feet at planting. Streams, I'm gonna rely on the staff to say how much regulatory authority we have over this, but from streams 100 feet but setback. Lighting directed toward the interior of the property and the same would apply, as I said earlier, to R56 and quarry. Now there's been a great deal of discussion as whether the 1,500 feet is excessive, whether we would be better left at another number. My personal opinion is that uh, 15 might be too much. It's been suggested 750 feet. I believe that might be too little. I believe we need to be a little, well, significantly north of that. What I would like to do, if it pleases the chair at this time, Mr. Chairman, is, uh, is make a motion that we charge our staff to uh, review this matter and amend R53 and R56 there would be no changes to R57, and under R52, which is the storage of ammunition and explosives, am I right, Mr. Bowl? Yes, sir. That uh, we ask them to look at that in regard to what other counties have done. Uh, the folks at Elmwood nor Mr. Bowles in our private discussions could develop a consensus as to what needs to be done, but it probably needs some attending to. Uh, in that motion, I would like to say that I think that the staff and the planning board in regard to setbacks on R53 and 56, I think they do need some guiding. And I would like to suggest that they come back with a recommendation of 1,000 feet setback from the property line in R53 and 56 at a minimum. I don't think that's excessive given the type of activity activity that will go on those areas. Any further comments? Um, I'd just like to uh, expand on that a little bit in terms of uh, the issues that the staff uh, would be looking at and uh, to also consider you know, as we look at countywide application, not just a, a specific location, but, you know, what impacts there might be relative uh, throughout the county uh, based on the amount of setbacks uh, employed or decided upon. And also to consider, um, as some jurisdictions have, uh, not just perhaps, uh, you know, from property line to the interior of the operation, wherever that is, as being the setback, uh, but whether to take into account pre-existing residences and perhaps look at, you know, how far does this activity need to be from a residence versus a property line? And uh, as I said, that that is a, a different means of measurement that have been, has been used by some jurisdictions. I, I, I have no problem with anything you just said, Mr. Chairman. I think that's wise counsel. Yeah. Could, I, could I presume to ask Mr. Pope? Mr. Pope, and I know you've uh, you charged Ms. Valdez with looking into this matter. Do you have a high degree of comfort that given the structure of the county zone, <clears throat> that should someone initiate a petition in the interim before we can get this thing uh, amended and adopted, that these folks have some level of protection in regard to vested rights by a petitioner and that you think we can move in a quick enough time that uh, they would have safeguards every bit as, as adequate as a moratorium or somewhere less than that or can you give an opinion on that? 
Uh, I'm going to punt this over to my law partner, Lisa Valdez. Uh, my my own opinion is that uh, uh, there theoretically there could be some possibilities of uh, vested rights uh, creating an issue, but it's more of a problem in theory than in fact. Uh, vested rights and rezoning are not exactly the same thing. Uh, and uh, what would happen here, I guess, would be some request for rezoning. And um, Lisa, would you would would you address that? Well, I think you just answered the the question pretty well. That the steps that are required at this point, because of the zoning ordinance, for I believe all those uses would be a rezoning to an industrial district or to an M1 or M2. Um, so you have that process that an applicant has to go through. And a straight rezoning is not a, a, a governmental approval that typically can be relied upon for the purposes of vested rights. Some of those uses also, are, it's already built into the ordinance, require a special use permit. So that's a second hurdle that would have to be undertaken by an applicant. That Achieving that and getting that special use permit does give them some vesting, but that's not something that's going to happen overnight. And and I believe that your planning board and and the and staff can get through the text amendment process faster than than that than that process can play out. Miss Valdez, is you did you given us your interpretation, which I I agree with. I, I've learned to rely upon your legal advice and uh, haven't been harmed by it yet. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That, with the reticence of this board to include the, this property in the commercial node on 70, and explicit comments by members of this board in regard to a reticence to proceed with the rezoning, that pretty much creates a watertight compartment for these folks, wouldn't you think? I'm sorry, I'm not following your question. Well, I'm just saying, as far as their level of comfort is, as far as moving forward and somebody establishing any vesting, whether they could, in theory, as Mr. Pope says, better than, in fact, given the fact that they would have all these hurdles that you just mentioned in regard to the law, coupled with this board's reticence to include it in the commercial node, and reticence that's expressed by members of this board to to vote for a rezoning in advance of it on at least three occasions that I'm aware of. That in your mind, that should give a high degree of comfort to these folks that uh, nothing's going to transpire till before we can fix this thing. R right. If, if I'm understanding you correctly in the comparison of what happened earlier versus a rezoning application in this situation, coupled with the fact that you have a land use plan that specifically talks about a residential rural character in that area and not an industrial character. I, I think that there are the safeguards in addition to that should give some comfort to to how the process would play out. Now, I was asked to come to one attorney's office a few years ago and he says, what, what do you think it will take for you to vote to rezone that property? I said, what if a certain location were to freeze over and I got out and walked on it? Because <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy living here and <laughs> Sometimes it's necessary for me to drive through that community, but I thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Any further comments? Uh, uh, just, just one consideration. I, I, um, first of all, the Elmwood Strong people, I, I think, have been a, a good example about how to go about affecting change. Um, nobody was ugly. Nobody came here and screamed. Nobody sent us ugly emails. Um, so thank you for that. I think it, um, I think they help to reveal some of the uh, some of the weaknesses or, or some of the flaws in our in our current um, in our current zoning regulations a bit that certainly could could put a neighbor in a in a position they don't want to be and um, if I can oversimplify it it's like being in a restaurant if if, uh, if they have a smoking section and a non-smoking section. And you're the table that's in the non-smoking section, but the next table over is in the smoking section. You're in the smoking section, you know. And but somewhere you have to draw that line. And just like in the previous zoning case, you know, if you happen to be the residence and you're next to a business, 
um, you know, it's you're in a tough spot. You're in a tough spot. What I what I just want to make sure that we don't do. It doesn't mean that we're not trying to take care take care of your concerns. Is I want to make sure that, however this is worded and whatever recommendations come before us, that that we don't accidentally throw the baby out with the bathwater and have some unintended consequences. And that basically, in order to in order to allay some of your concerns, that we in essence have excluded. Uh, properties that right now are considered for for industrial development in the county that now with with longer bigger larger setbacks and and restrictions that that it excludes properties that really could have been developed doesn't mean we water it down to where it doesn't make any where where it doesn't achieve your objectives I just want to if I can where's Matthew in the back Let's just when when we when when you come back to us, let let's make sure that this is worded so that so that we're not so that we're not taking developable industrial property off the market. Okay? And uh, now there's some that we probably want to because it would fit into this category for somebody who isn't Elmwood strong, okay? But I just think I I would like for us to be a little bit cautious okay I know I know everybody wants to be in a hurry but um, I think sometimes government by process is deliberative so that we so that we don't end up with unintended consequences that's all so I don't think that changes the uh, to use an army term commander's intent yeah. or the um, or the spirit of what we're trying to do I just want to make sure that whatever we write we realize it's going to apply across the entire county, and it and it needs to make sense there as well. So, okay. that's it. All right. Any further comments? Well, there's uh, a motion by Commissioner Johnson as uh, enhanced by our discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. And motion carries unanimously. All right. Move on to. Uh, New business? Any new business commissioners aware of? None. On to the county manager's report, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, very little to report. Just want to hand out a, uh, a pamphlet that's been developed by the Parks and Recreation Department uh, in association with the Jennings Road project or Jennings Park project and the recent grant uh, money that we have been uh, awarded. Uh, Michelle Hepler, our director, is actively seeking corporate sponsors, and this is information uh, that she is submitting uh, in those meetings. And her and uh, Commissioner Norman uh, recently had one of those visits, and we will see if she has to make more. So I just thought you would like that as information. Right. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay. Uh, we'll now entertain a motion to move into closed session for discussion of matters relating to economic development pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11 subsection A4 as well as attorney client General Statute 143-318.11 subsection A3 and property acquisition North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11 subsection A5. Is there a motion? So moved. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. We are in recess. <clears throat>
retreat. Okay, we will now uh, resume open session. Uh, we have two motions in relation to economic development, uh, the issues on property acquisition and uh, attorney-client, uh, no action is necessary in open session. Uh, is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I offer a motion to amend the previous approved incentive to reduce the threshold required to qualify for a sixth year from 38 million assessed value to 26 million of assessed value for Project Nike. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Johnson. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, there is a second motion. Mr. Chairman, I make the motion to extend the previous contract for Project Forsyth, McLean Curtis, for an additional 180 days. Motion by Commissioner Robertson. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, there is no further business to come before the Commission. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Adjourn. Good job, gents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.